Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, March 24th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. This week's week in charts is brought to you by me, once again. You can get started with my trading service. You can actually get started for free. Right now, I'm doing a trial for $47. I might eventually eliminate that. I haven't really decided uh, just yet now that we have the uh, delayed service, but uh, check that out, and you can go to that uh, website link. There's a disclaimer screen. I don't think it's in there somewhere. Basically, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, um, so what are we going to talk about? Well, I kind of woke up this morning and was thinking about some things yesterday, and I wasn't really sure exactly what to talk about. And then, luckily, I got a couple of emails from you guys and girls. So that's uh, I figured, you know what? Let's uh, let's you guys direct the show this week. So here's an email that I got. Uh, can you go over RSYS for me in chart show? Absolutely. And she went on to say. Also, can you talk about portfolio diversification? For example, how many gold miner stocks would you get positions in before you said enough? How many issues in an industry before you say enough versus how many in a stock sector before you say enough? For example, I own two gold miner stocks, and now I'm looking at two possible setups in silver miners or industrial metal miners. Is activity stocks and metals and mining? I hope this makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, there's a couple things here that she she's asking about, like the the specific sector and the broader sector. So I'm going to break that down in just one second. Uh, before we do that, and this is Dr. J, she's been a client for a long, long time. Um, this chart got a little cut off. If you guys can hang there for a second, well, it's still okay. So this is a stock she's asking about. And one thing that's kind of cool is notice that base for a long, long time. And I'm a big fan of bases. I prefer if the base were down here towards the old lows, the all-time lows here. But close enough. It's still coming off of all-time lows. It made the mother of all bases, and then it took off. Now, the problem that I'm seeing is that notice that it had this huge wide range bar here. And then it sort of began to kind of, it kept higher, but it didn't continue higher with as much vigor. Let's see if we could, um, let's see if we could get up a, uh, the actual chart just so I can show you what's going on here. Just give me one second. Talk amongst yourselves. Do, 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 do. All right, let's see. So the point I was trying to make is that it lost some steam in here a little bit. Notice that it kind of took off, was off to the races. And then it did continue higher, but notice that this was one bar, and then this was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven bar. So ideally you want to see a stock that's accelerating. I would prefer that if this wide range bar were up here. Now the other thing too is it's made a tremendous run from 280 up to four over a short period of time. So what I would like to also see is I'd like to see a much deeper pullback. So the stock looks okay. And when I back the chart further out, I see, well, wait a minute. This thing's kind of wide and loose longer term. Now, granted, we're going way back to 2012, but it did have a big gap back there. And then it traded lower, then it went up, then it went down, then it went up, then it went down, bounced around, bounced around. And then finally it found its low in 2015. So not that I would say, okay, well, this is going back years and years and years. I wouldn't necessarily write off a stock because it behaved like this years ago. But I would certainly consider that behavior if I wasn't 100% excited about the stock now. So there's a good point to be made here. Keep in mind that a personality of a stock can change. The makeup of a company can change. Their technology can, can change. The technology of the future can actually, instead of being the technology of the future always, might actually come to fruition. For instance, we had those solar stocks take off really nicely in 2013. 
And before 2013, solar stocks kind of like uh, there was some initial excitement. They kind of like did that for years. And they finally bottomed out and rallied nicely in 2013. Some of the biggest winners were solar stocks back then. So the personality can change of the stock. And there's a lot of things that can change that makes that personality change. And obviously, we're looking at just the chart, but a lot of these factors do uh, come in. But the fact that most of this move was made just on this huge wide range bar, and then it kind of like lost a little steam in here. Yeah, it still went higher, but that would immediately make me raise a red flag. And then once I find something that I'm not 100% keen on, I begin to look back in time to see if there's anything else I could sort of pick apart. OK, so the point I'm trying to make here is that if this was the mother of all fantastic setups, let's say it was just coming off of this low here and it did make a nice base down here. Then it made a nice persistent uptrend and then accelerated in that uptrend and began to pull back. Then I was like, you know what? All of this trumps all of this. OK, but the fact that I can kind of pick it apart over the short term makes me think that, OK, well, I think I would pass on this trade. Okay. Now, getting to her portfolio question, and she asked a, a, a fairly detailed question. So let me start with the general and then drill down a little bit into the details. Now, I don't want to go through this entire spreadsheet because I've done that quite a bit in the past, but there are a couple things I want to point out. Anything that's highlighted is still open anything that's white has been closed out okay so on each position I divided it into two uh, by the way somebody asked me do I do you buy 250 shares and make another order for 250 shares if you're dividing by two no you buy the whole 500 if that's what you're buying okay and then you divide it into two and you might want to go with round numbers on that to make your life easier this is all just a hypothetical. I would never buy 317 shares of a stock or whatever that is times two. I'd round it off one way or the other. But the point is that you divide half into what you want to be your swing trade, where you're looking for a 1% gain on the overall portfolio. You're risking 2%, okay? So in a 100K account, that'd be 1K. So you're looking for 1K on the first low. Sometimes you get a little more like you did here. Sometimes you get a little less. Depends on how everything shakes out. Oops. No, nope. we did get exactly that amount. So sometimes you get a little more. Sometimes you get a little less. But you're looking for just a little quick swing trade. And this is going to kind of dovetail into what the next uh, gentleman's question is. But you're looking for that swing trade. And then you're looking for hopefully some multiple thereof. Now, when you see... A position like this one here which is yellow for the first half and the second half that's a full position so let's call that one that's one full position when you see one that is white for half and yellow for the second that's a half position because we took off half of the position when it hit the profit target here's another half of position okay so if we add it up right now we have one half position in the banks, which is right here. And then we have one half position in metals and mining and energy. Okay. Now it's a little confusing. Uh, I think a rock, let me check real quick to see how that shakes out. Let's see, let's see how it's defined. A rock is oil and gas. CNX is metals, but it's it's technically all all a gas. And CNX is pure metals, so that's where it gets a little muddy. But for argument's sake, let's just assume that because TC has them listed this way, let's assume that this is a metal stock, this is a metal stock, and this is an oil and gas. Okay, so we have one half of a bank which is OZRK, that's a short. We have one half of a metal plus one half of a metal. So one half plus one half M&M, &M, metals and mining, equals one full position there. Now it's two different stocks, but it's just one full position. And in the energies, we have one full position. So 
and the energies, we have one full position. So my general rule is two positions in one sector as a maximum. But here's the thing. Once you begin hitting profit targets, so in this case, we had two battles hit the profit target, metals and mining stocks. So that opens up one slot. So we could add one metals and mining. Now, she asked a fairly complex question because what do you do about like gold versus the other metals? Because the other metals can be like this particular case, the CNX, even though it's metals and mining, it's kind of energy related. It's uh, I think they have coal or something in there um, as part of their mining. So that kind of muddies it up a little bit. But as a general statement, I will be, I kind of put gold and silver in the same category. And yeah, there's still metals and we'll, we'll move a lot like the metals, but I might be a little bit more lenient to add on, let's say a gold stock, even if I already have two full positions in the metals. Now, if I don't have any positions in the metals, then I'll put a gold stock in and then either another gold stock or another or or a silver stock. OK, so and then at that point, I still might consider a metals and mining. But as a general statement, without the, the complexity of the gold versus metals and mining kind of mucks it up a little bit. But as a general statement, two positions per sector. OK. Two positions, POS. Yeah, two positions per sector. Okay. Now, those two positions, once you sell half and sell half, you open up another slot for another position. So you can end up with three positions in one sector, okay? And that would be one full position and plus two half positions. So you'd end up with three different stocks, but the total positions is one half. The point I'm trying to make is as you scale out of positions, and more specifically two positions, you open up a slot for another position. Metals and mining and the energies and all, it all kind of sometimes intertwines a little bit. But as a pure play, two positions per sector. And then if, you, if you're digging down to metals and mining, no pun intended, then if you already have a couple metals and mining on, then it's okay to add, it's still okay to add a gold stock, okay? Now, keep in mind that as you're adding more, you're not going to just rush it as a general statement. They're not all going to usually trigger the same day. You're not going to usually all find the setups and go after them all at once. So it will happen over a period of time. And if you have a few stocks in your portfolio and they start banging out the profit target, then you're opening up slots. But a lot of times you'll see me, now this is just kind of a discretionary call, but you'll see I'll have a few stocks, maybe a couple of metals in mining and maybe a couple of energy stocks in the portfolio, and they're not quite hitting that profit target yet, okay? So if they're not hitting a profit target yet, even if I don't have a full uh, position in each sector, then I might not be inclined to take more setups until those slots begin to free up. And that goes for a general statement with any sector. Now, I know I just said two and two. It's a little confusing. But let's say I had a metals and mining and, a, and an energy stock already in the portfolio, neither one of those were, were hitting the profit target just yet. Before I add that second metals and that second energy, I need to think long and hard whether or not I really, really like that setup, even though I will allow two positions per sector. The other thing that I'm point that I like to make is let's say we've got five stocks on and they could be in any sector and not one of them and it's hit the profit target yet. At that point in time I start getting a little nervous and I tell myself, hey, self, maybe you don't have the best portfolio in the world because you put in these five positions and you're not banging on any profit targets yet. Maybe market conditions have changed. Maybe something's wrong. Before you add that sixth position in, it better be one charming position. It better, look, it better be able to walk on water, okay, before you add that sixth position in if five positions aren't working. Now, I'm often asked the same thing. A similar question is, well, how many open positions will you have? Well, I've seen as many as 10 open, but here's the thing. Once you get that many positions on, especially if you tap the brakes after about five, if you're not seeing a lot of great new setups, there's a pretty darn good chance you're already scaling out. So by the time I get 10 positions on, 
I might have already opened up five slots. So I have 10 half positions on, okay? Because remember, we're scaling out of these. So don't overthink it too much. You could step on the gas a little bit, like let's say you already have two metals and they're getting close to the profit targets and you see a goal that you really like. You could put that goal stock on knowing that you're gonna have a slot open up soon. Just like I'm often asked, what about margin? Well, let's say you got a portfolio of 10 stocks and three or four have already hit the profit target and you're pretty much out of buying power, but you know that some of those other stocks are getting pretty close to cashing out for at least a half a profit. So you know you're going to be opening up some money. You just don't have any at the moment available, any margin available, any, any money available, I should say, cash. So it's okay to go into a little bit of margin because conditions are obviously really well doing you're really good if you have that many open positions and they're hitting the profit target so it's okay to go into a little margin and i kind of see it as a transition okay we're going to put on this new position okay we got the new position on we're using that margin oh another position just hit the profit target yay i'm gonna tell all my friends so we take off half now you're coming off you're already coming off of that margin so if you do go into margin not that we'll get too sidetracked in that make sure it's just a transition so hopefully that made sense anybody um Anybody want to, um, anybody have any questions on that, directly related to that? <laughs> All right, I'll get to that in a second, Jerry. Good good, uh, good point. In fact, that, this will be a good uh, transition. Uh, Jerry says, Dave, I have a friend who wants to make $300 a week trading. I told him he would be better served if he would learn your methods. Could you comment on this a minute or so? Yeah, you know, uh, I'm going to have a quote from Livermore here in just one second. And uh, you always get something good out of Livermore. And one of the things he said is uh, something about the, the chap that uh, expects Wall Street to give him a regular paycheck. And that's why I'm always talking so much about patience, because you want to or you have to. You have to wait for that next trade. And you don't know when that next big winner is going to come along. So I kind of see what I do as more capital growth in, in that aforementioned little uh, little stores or, or stocks, plural. Uh, you go through a print money phase and you make a lot of money, but then in between you kind of grind it out, make a little, lose a little, hopefully not lose too much, but you make enough to kind of balance it out. And then you have to wait. Like they said, market wizards, three months out of a year, you're hot. You're so hot. Can't sleep at night. Three months out of a year, you're cold. You're so cold. You wonder what's going on. You can't sleep at night. And then six months out of the year, you grind it out wondering when the next profit's going to come. Okay. So you never know when that big winner's going to come along, and that's that's going to kind of dovetail into my next uh, question because somebody was asking or, or was going to ask when you'll see in a second about, hey, I can't – I can get the initial profit target out, but I can't sit around and watch those profits evaporate. Well, unless you're willing to sit through those profits evaporating, then you're never going to catch the big winner, and you'll never be a successful trader. Now – the reason I'm bringing up the big winners is because the the way you make money, the real money is in the longer term trade. The real money is not in these little swing trades that we have in here. OK, well, why are we bothering with them? Well, because the volatility or, or the stop is based on the short term volatility. So we're able to risk a little bit less on the position than we would if we were trying or a lot less, I should say, than if we were trying to capture a longer term trade but we're going to make that transition into the longer term trade by sort of having our cake and eating it too we get a little profit off the table if it doesn't materialize so what we put something in our pocket better than poking the arm if it does materialize then we've already paid ourselves a little bit and then there's the potential to be right big i'm often asked is your money in position management psychological or statistical and my answer is yes it's statistical in that you don't often get that longer term move. I mean, I hate to quantify it to statistics, but there's, but back when I did a lot of system testing, there's about a 28% chance that your position is going to turn into a longer term winner. And then there's a 70 something percent chance, 72%, I guess, chance or more, maybe even 80% or more that it won't. So it's kind of that Pareto principle thing kind of shows up again. 20% of your position is going to make 80% of your money. So it is a little skewed in, in that aspect, and that, that comes into the psychology and the importance of understanding psychology. I'm going to flesh that out here. 
in just one second. In fact, let's just hop right into that. Um, well, before we do that, let me just finish finish answering your question. So the only way that you can make consistent income in a market is to do one of two things. You could trade mean reversion strategies and you could you could buy markets as they become oversold and sell markets as they become overbought because the chances are pretty good that they're going to turn at that juncture and there's a chance that you're going to be right. Pretty good chance you're going to be right. Unfortunately, you're occasionally going to get whacked so big because if you do that properly, people say you, you can't use stops. Well, if you're not using stops, you're going to get whacked so big, you're going to get wiped out every now and then and have to start over. The second way to make a consistent income in the market would be to sell options. Now, that's going to work great until it don't. And trust me, I, I've got some battle scars from some of this type of trading or from all of this type of trading, I should say. And experience is the best teacher sometimes, okay? The problem with something like selling options is it could work for a very long time until it don't. It could work years and years and years, and then all of a sudden you blow up. So if you quit before you blow up, congratulations. Now, I guess there's another sh very uh, – Another way I suppose you could make a consistent income is that if you figured out a way to scalp and day trade, but I think that that would eventually kill you. You're making too many decisions, and you're also making little bitty bitty gains again, and still your the potential for a big loss is still there. So anytime you you have somebody touting a highly accurate system. If you look carefully at their numbers, they're making little bitty, bitty, tiny gains, okay? Somebody had sent one out and had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of trades, and they made like $30,000. If you add it all up, it was only a few bucks on every trade, and I don't know if they remembered to put the commissions in or not, but a few trades would wipe you out at least for maybe six or eight months worth of gains. So be careful of those so-called income-producing strategies. That could probably make a lot of money. Um, in my educational business, if I said, hey, I got this income producing thing, you know, because there's no such thing. There's no such cash cow when it comes to markets. Maybe if markets were normally distributed, there would be. That's what casinos do. They make a consistent paycheck because they know they even if they're down to only like a half a percent odds on certain games, which I'm sure it's a little bit more than that, but not much. Let's just say half percent. Well, a half percent on millions and billions and billions of dollars. In fact, it's a multi-trillion dollar business, gambling, that is, is a lot of money, okay? And if you've if you ever been to Vegas, it's like somebody paid for all that, and that somebody is you. So they know statistically day in and day out they're going to get the paycheck. In the markets, it doesn't work that way. It's skewed. But we could use that skew to our advantage by positioning ourselves for the short-term gain and stick around for the longer-term gain. If you're just trying to take little pieces, little pieces, little pieces, there's an old commodity adage, eat like a bird, shit like an elephant. That means take a bunch of little tiny, 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 tiny gains and make a huge loss. I was watching a mockumentary or a documentary, whatever you want to call it, on, on YouTube about some Forex trader. And every time he tried to walk away from his screen, he'd have to run back because something happened, an alert would go off or whatever. And he was making like one or two pips per trade. And then he took like, a, I forget how many pips it was. It was something ridiculous, like a 200 pip loss. So then he really had to grind it out like the little rat banging on his keyboard trying to get the cocaine for the next several days to try to, quote unquote, revenge, revenge trade and make back what he lost. So be careful of anything when it comes to uh, an income producing machine. OK, sorry about the long with an answer on that. Yeah, this is recorded. Uh, it'll be on YouTube. Thank you, Ray, for your interest. Uh, join my YouTube channel or go to videos on my website. All right, got another question. I've been looking at charts for years. I was wondering if you had an opinion on whether to look at charts logarithmic or linear. Um, I don't know what linear is, but I use arithmetic, which I'm assuming is the same thing. 
the reason I'm using arithmetic is I'm looking at a shorter term time frame. Like we just, like for Dr. J, we were just looking at the last 10 bars or so to decide whether or not we wanted to pursue the trade further before looking at the rest of the history. So in doing that, I want to see the arithmetic move over that period of time. If it doubled or tripled or whatever happened, I want to see that arithmetically. And that's just how I started trading and looking at charts and learning how to read charts 20-something years ago, 30 years ago, whenever I first got started. To each his own. That's my own personal preference, okay? So a lot of people get into a lot of arguments over this. I don't think it really matters. Uh, by default, I think when I start looking at weekly and monthly charts, TC automatically moves me over to a logarithmic chart. And I will we'll look at that when we get the actual charts and take a look at the weekly charts in a few minutes. So I don't think I don't I think it's something that it's more academic than you have to deal with in reality. But I like arithmetic charts. I don't know if I can make a huge case for them. I just like to see the actual move. So um, I don't want to see the, the move mitigated by the nature of a logarithmic chart okay so longer term by by default i am looking at logarithmic but that's not by intention okay i was wondering if your website has a yearly track record anyway uh anywhere i don't publish official results i do have a youtube video out there if you go to videos on my website i have a video of the um if you took the official recommendations, but with a little bit of discretion, because I believe in using discretion. So you can check that out. Um, it's a little dated, but the newer results should uh, work in nicely once I add those in. Um, and it does have the compounding in it. Now, I do have the last 10 or 12 years of my trading service available for download. There is a gap in there that I have to fix because the files are huge. I need to figure out an easy way to, to download them, but I think I have them on Amazon. So if anybody is, if anybody needs them right away before I uh, get that gap fixed, let me know and I'll see if I can still find them on Amazon S3. But if you sign up for the delayed service, you can look at the last oh, year or two, uh, at least one year, you can look at the last year, every single day, every single video, through the delayed service and then there's a link to the rest of the archives and again there's a gap in there I need to fix and I know it's it's kind of hard when you run a small office to to take care of everything but if you need them right away let me know and I'll work on that for you the reason I don't publish official results is because I don't want the service to be seen as a tip sheet I want to see it as it is here's the thing it's for educational purposes only so I'm not sure the legality of publishing quote unquote official results anyway without a, a boatload of disclaimers. But I do run through the open portfolio, as you just saw. I do that every day. So you can see the open portfolio every single day in the archives. And I also like to provide ancillary setups. I call it my Landry list. And some of those stocks even recently have taken off nicely. So I like to see it as a whole package. That plus color commentary, what's going on, a daily breakdown of everything. So it's a lot more to it that just whatever I think is the best setup out of all the setups, because sometimes in some of those ancillary setups, and then I don't want to turn this into a, a conversation about the Landry list, but the Landry list is a list of stocks that I like in addition to my official recommendations. Now, some of those are in the process of setting up. Some of them are set up and more volatile than the, than I want to put as an official recommendation and the more aggressive traders might want to go after them. Some of them might be a little bit thinner, like there's one now that I really like, but it's kind of a little bit thinner. And some of the more aggressive traders, more experienced traders might want to go after that. So I've kept a lot of clients happy over the years with the Landry list of stocks. I could tell you that. And I have a lot of testimonials based on that too. So uh, no official results, but I do have some, uh, you can get some ideas by looking at the YouTube on there. Uh, it does, in general, beat the S&P very nicely over time, but not all the time, okay? So when you see a year like 2007 and the market gets kind of choppy like this and slowly begins to roll over, the equity curve will look something like this. And then as the market continues to roll over, the equity curve will start looking like that because we do short, okay? So when it gets choppy, we'll start stopping out of stocks and reposition the short side if it rolls over. Uh, 
2015, we did okay in spite of a market that actually lost three quarters of a percent due to careful stock selection. So, but I'm working on getting those uh, results out there. Yeah, I, I like what Craig says. It's just how to make $500, $300 a week. Start without with enough, enough capital so you don't need $300 a week. And that's the, that's the secret is seeing like you don't need the money. Because in a recent column, I, I wrote a recent column not too long ago. If you look at the archives of the random thoughts, there's some good stuff out there if I say so myself. And after I wrote like some steps that you need to take, I, it, I, it dawned on me before I published it, maybe I need to, to, to set up a few pre, prerequisites beforehand, okay? And one of the prerequisites, requisites, if I could, it's hard for me to say. <laughs> one of the prereqs is that you are adequately capitalized. Like a client of mine says, you have to sing like you don't need the money, okay? Which is going to dovetail nicely into the rest of Rick's question. So, yeah. You shouldn't say, I need this much money out of the market because the market doesn't care what you need. And you're going to create, and I hate for freshman psychology to rear its ugly head, as it often does in this, but you're going to create some psychological problems for yourself when, as quoting Livermore says, you're expecting that paycheck. And even worse, you need the market to give you that paycheck. So that gets pretty dangerous pretty quickly. And you also start making a lot of mistakes. Let's say you need that $300 to pay your rent and you're up $300 in a position and the position looks fantastic. Well, if you let that position ride, you might make as much as $20,000 on that position. It's possible. Okay. It doesn't come along every day, but it's possible. I've seen it. Okay. But what's going to happen? You're going to take that $300 off the table. Okay. What if you're down $100 on a position and you still need that $300? So not only do you need $300, you're down $100. So you're, you're looking at $400 you've got to come up with. And then that position goes down a little bit further. Say it's down $150. Now you got to come up with $450. So you might be stressing out a little bit. And you know what? You're just going to shut that position down. Well, guess what? It seems like, and it's, I guess I think this has always been the case. I was recently asked by Stocks and Commodities Magazine if uh, what's changed since the 90s. And to me, it seems like trends don't last as long, but maybe it's just because they had that one fantastic period in the late 90s where you just printed money all the time. But it seems now more than in the past, positions go against you, and you just have to let them go against you, provided you're not stopped out, kind of close your eyes, look the other way, and find another opportunity. Focus your energies on finding more opportunities than stressing out over the position. Because I guarantee you, if you exit at a small profit, you're never going to catch big profits. And if you exit at a small loss, provided it's it's above your where your stop should be, the amount of loss is not near where your stop should be, then you're never going to catch any big gainers either. So psychologically, it could be pretty tough to try to to make money. In fact, let me answer the rest of Rick's question. It's going to make a lot of more sense, okay? Uh, one more psychology question, if I might. You can ask all you want, Rick. You seem that you seem like all the greats. Oh, thank you. To break trading down to psychology. Well, the longer I'm at this, the more and more I focus or have been focusing on the psychology of trading. Even, even when I'm going back to to the start, to the beginning, and I've been working on a beginner's course, like a complete beginner's course, which I realized that even though my stuff is really simplified, maybe I'm not even simplified enough for the, for the very, very beginner. And it made me realize that I think that if I could take someone from the beginning and get them thinking about psychology first and foremost – then the other pieces will really fall nicely into place. So as I think I've said over and over, it's like when you first get in this, you're like setup, 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 pattern, setups, methodology, setups, pattern, setup, setup, setups. You're like the setup junkie, okay? 
And then do you realize, well, wait a minute, I need some money management. So you start spending more and more time on money management. Well, the third piece is psychology. And I found that since I've been doing this for so long, that's becoming more and more and more important. And that's why you hear me talk so much about the psychology of trading. I think if you get the psych, you know, not that you, you can't do one without the other. Of course, there's three pieces, right? That's like three quartered rope. Psychology, money management, and of course, the methodology. But you can't have one without the other. But I think that if you did master the psychology, the other two would fall nicely into place and you'd have all three pieces. I fail at trading because I can't stand to see a drawdown. I can place a trade and take off half, but then I have to take the other half off as it pulls back. So what he's saying is, let's say we got a generic little pullback. We get a little entry. We have an initial profit target right here. In other words, a little bit of a swing trade. He hits that initial profit target, and he takes off half of his position. And he feels pretty good about that. But what happens next? He's got the stop bumped up to break even. That's how our money management works. When this starts to go against him a little bit, and he sees that, let's say he's – got 100K and this is a $1,000 profit. He sees that $1,000 profit begin to erode on the remaining shares, then he bails out. The problem with that is a lot of times, and, and we've got three positions right now that have already hit the profit target. Maybe, maybe they'll pan out so I can show you that in real time. Maybe uh, six months from now, we'll be looking at these. The problem with that is if you exit as, you, as these open profits begin to evaporate, if that market turns back up, you'll never catch this move. Now, keep in mind, we're not playing for this. Again, this little bit hit here helps keep the lights on. It helps keep you afloat. It helps balance out the drawdown overall. But you're not going to get rich taking a little small profit. And you're certainly not going to get rich if you cash out when the rest of that remaining profit begins to go against you because this – is the big prize. This is what we're going for. And this is where the real money is made. And if you quit every time you give up a little bit of money, you'll never get to here. It's like quitting at the 50 yard line. You're never going to make a touchdown. Okay. I have no faith that it will come back. Well, the market's going to do what the market's going to do. It doesn't care about you. It doesn't care about me. And it doesn't care about the guy that screams on TV. As I was talking with someone a while back, the way I see it is in for a penny, in for a pound. You place your trades and you just let them unfold and see what happens. I guess I just don't have enough experience at winning. Should I place the trade and then cut my hands off? Okay. Well, here's the way I see it. You know what you're doing wrong? Well, you know what you're doing wrong. As Rick just pointed out, he told me what he's doing wrong. Somebody had emailed me a while back and, and we were talking about, uh, was quoting Peter from the Bible. And I think Peter says, uh, I'm paraphrasing. He says, I, I know I'm doing the wrong thing, but I do it anyway. And that's the thing, when I go to work one-on-one -on -one with someone, I always get a little nervous, at least initially thinking, how am I going to figure out what they're doing wrong? And then, as I say a thousand times, I just ask. And usually they tell me, and if they don't, and bear with me guys who have been with me for a while, because I'm going to say it again. If they don't, I look at their trades, and then I say, hey, you know, you're supposed to be position trading following along and you just made these 30 or 40 day trades. And if you take those day trades out, which lost $5,000, you would have actually made some money. Not a lot because this was a choppy period, but you would actually have been in the black for the last six months during this, even during this choppy period in service. That was one specific example. But time and time again, I've seen things where it's like, well, you're, it looks like you're, you're cutting your profit short. I know. Looks like you're not honoring your stops. You let your losses get too big. I know. And so 
usually people know what they're doing. Like Livermore says, a speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. So I could get you 90% there, but you've got to take the leap and of faith and get to the other 10%. And that other 10% is to follow the plan. I could lay out the plan for you and give you everything you need, but at some point you're going to have to take the reins and take control. Now, it does, when I say take the reins, it doesn't. I'm not saying get rid of me, keep me on staff. You know, it's like recently. Sometimes I'm a victim of my own success. And, and recently, I was asking someone, "Hey, you ready to sign up for service?" And they're like. Uh, renew you've been with me for three years well dave i've done so well i think i got it figured out it's like well keep me on staff like an institution if you did well for an institution it's like you know hey let's keep dave on staff he's doing a good job for us so by turning over the reins i don't mean get rid of me because I, I work hard to be your analyst what i'm saying is you're going to have to follow that plan OK, you're going to have to take that leap of faith you're going to have to let that open profit evaporate knowing that there's probably a good chance you get stopped out and you have to, for lack of a better word, piss that money away. It'll feel like that, at least initially. But you have to realize that in order to make money, a lot of times you have to be willing to to lose money, okay? Um, I really enjoyed Curtis' Facebook, and I think you guys should read that. Not so much from a, uh, oh, I'm going to go out and, and try to trade like a turtle and 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 have these abysmal drawdowns and do all this other crazy stuff. But from more of a, from a, a, not from an educational standpoint, but from an entertaining standpoint. The reason I read the book, as I've said before, is I was at a conference and I was um, hanging out with Larry McMillan and we're drinking beer and uh, somehow it came up. We, we were talking about the, the turtles and all. It's like, I hadn't read any of those books. Yeah, I just, I didn't see really the need. He's like, well, the one that Curtis Faith wrote was pretty cool because they talk about having a ping pong table in their office and they became, which could probably be qualified as semi-professional ping pong players because a lot of times it wasn't anything to do to play ping pong. So there's a lot of entertaining things like that in there, which, which there are some hidden lessons if you really read it. So I would strongly urge you to read the book. Anyway, the point I'm bringing up is Curtis Face said that that um, Dennis treated open losses drawdowns differently than just plain old drawdowns. So the point there is, so let's say you, this is your equity curve and does that. Then Dennis questioned this, like, why are you losing money? Okay. But if you are making money and then giving some up, even if it's a substantial amount based on following the system, then he didn't seem to have much of a problem with this because that comes to territory. Because after some somewhat of a steep drawdown, if you're longer term trend following, then you have new trades coming up. By the way, as I often say, the late great Mark Douglas, who we lost uh, just last year, I, I like, I got one of his cassette tapes. I know a lot of you don't even know what a cassette tape is. It's this little plastic thing, and it has literally this the recording tape in there. It's a, they used to record things on a piece of tape. Um, anyway, and one of his cassette tapes from a TAG conference, anybody remember a TAG conference, Technical Analysis Group? They got bought out by Traders Expo, and then Traders Expo got bought out again, and... Um, but anyway, long story endless, I got some tapes from my TAG conference back in 90-something, 90 94, maybe 93. And in one of the tapes, I like what, uh, what Mark Douglas said. He said that a good salesman makes a few calls and he gets rejected and he goes and get a, gets a cup of coffee and sits back down. He gets all energized and says, all right. I've got some losers out the way. Now it's time for some winners. Statistically, over the next so many calls, because I had so many rejections, it's time for me to make a little money. The bad salesman gets rejected several times in a row, and he goes out and drinks his lunch. His lunch. So that's the difference between a winner and a loser. 
it's like you almost have to learn how to lose in this game, and I think that's what Rick is experiencing. He doesn't like to lose. Um, I don't know Rick personally. He's a client, but I don't know him personally other than through trading emails back and forth, trading, trading emails back and forth. <laughs> uh, but I'm guessing that he's a winner. In, in fact, most people that – if somebody's putting up hard-earned money to buy my products, which aren't necessarily cheap, okay, but I think they're worth it, then they're, they tend to be more motivated type of people. They tend to be successful, and they're trying to even become even more successful by becoming successful in the trading world. They're already successful doctors, lawyers, automatic transmission mechanics, dog trainers, coffee roasters. Sometimes a dog trainer and a coffee roaster mixed in one. <laughs> Craig, I think you're in here today. Um, BarkingSquirrelCoffee.com. That's Craig. So... They're already successful, and they want to be more successful. So it's hard for them to lose. But in trading, a lot of times, you have to be willing to lose. So you're going to have to put in some reps. And I think your mind is like a muscle. Once you get a muscle used to doing something, that muscle will grow. And... It's, it's like playing an instrument. They, they call it muscle memory. There's no such thing as actual muscle memory. It's been proven. It's actually in your brain, believe it or not. Your muscles, don't, your muscles have no way of remembering anything. But the point is, the more you practice an instrument, the better you get because it's so-called muscle memory. You get used to doing that to where it becomes second nature. You don't even know you're doing it. So I think the analogy of, of exercise and growing works well with trading. So you're going to have to make enough losing trades until you get to enough winning trades to realize how the process works, both good and bad. Now, I don't want to digress too far, but I've seen people where the winning goes to their head too. So that's a whole nother problem altogether. It's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem nonetheless. As Arnold said, the last three or four reps is what makes the muscle grow. The area of pain that divides a champion from someone else who is not a champion. This area of pain divides a champion from someone else who's not a champion. That's what most people lack, having the guts to go on and just say they'll go through the pain no matter what happens. No pain, no gain. Okay. So you're going to have to go through some bad trades. I get used to going through those trades. And as I've said quite often, which I'm going to get ready to talk about in just a few minutes, it has to be process oriented versus end goal oriented. Now, how do you do this? Well, probably the easiest way to do this would be to trade at such a small size that it's almost meaningless to you. Okay. And it's very easy. Now, maybe let's say Rick got, Rick has that 100K account. Rick can't give up $1,000 worth of gains and stop out of break even. And he has an even harder time of putting up $2,000 and letting that full $2,000 get wiped out on the inevitable bad trades. And he's trying to cut those losses too short. Everyone says cut your losses short. Well, that's fine. But... You can't cut up. You can't have too tight of a stop. That stop has to be far enough away, and you have to adjust your share size accordingly. So you really have to be process oriented when it comes to trading, and just follow the process, good, bad, or indifferent. Now here's the thing. And again, freshman psychology rears his ugly head. But if you can't follow the process, one way to do that, in addition to getting your share size down and being consistently at a very small share size, but one way to do that is stop watching the screen, okay? Stop doing that. You know, doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this. Well, stop doing that. 
reminds me of a funny story about a friend of mine's adolescent son, but I, I guess I can't tell that. <laughs> Finally, he's like, Dad, this is this hurts. Like, well, stop doing that. You know, it's like, stop doing that. Leave it alone. It'll stop hurting. So the easiest way to do that would be turn off your screen. Put in a hard stop and take your wife or your husband, whatever the case may be, to lunch or go off and do something or look for the next opportunity. So you have to be process oriented versus goal oriented or in goal oriented. As I wrote recently in my one of my columns, I will be process oriented versus in results oriented. I will congratulate myself regardless of the outcome if and only if I followed the process. I will recognize that if I did not follow a prudent process and was successful anyway, then I was just lucky. I've beat the dead horse too much on this, but the market can be a really bad teacher. And you know what's funny is in my emails, and that's one advantage I have, is I get constant emails reminding me of what not to do. So from a selfish standpoint, it's 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 a self reassuring type of thing, a constant reminder. But people will say, Hey Dave, you like the setup? No, I don't like it. And these are why these are reasons I don't like it. But I still like it and I I do like it. I said, Well, do what you want, but I don't like it. I think I think there are some problems with this particular setup, and I would not take the setup. So what happens? The setup takes off, and they take the trade. So a week from now, they email me, "Hey, Dave, look, it worked. I made all this money." And I'm like, oh, "Okay, that's great. I'm I'm happy for you. I'd rather see you make money and lose money. But just because you made money on a trade doesn't mean it was a good trade." to take okay let's say you buy a lottery ticket you win 50 bucks you're like well that was a smart thing to do because i made 50 bucks well not necessarily okay the link to this uh, article is here it's kind of a long link but all you have to do is go to my home page and under um blog i hate the word blog but I should call it columns, but click on random thoughts and then you'll get the archive of the random thoughts. That's the easiest way to get to it. And if you go down here all the way to the bottom, you'll see this 500 posts right here. Or more, five, over 500. So go in and read those as time allows. Don't operate every machinery after reading them, though. <laughs> so. Okay. So again, you have to be more process oriented. Okay, questions are coming in. Good questions, good questions. Okay, the check is in the mail, Dave. Thank you, Craig, appreciate that. I, I gotta tell you, I really been enjoying that coffee. We might have to work out a little quid pro quo on the coffee versus uh, products here, you know? Uh, I think I think the Costa Rican is, is my favorite. That Ethiopian gave it a good run for its money, but I think I'm gonna go back to the Costa Rican. Okay. Would you be better off with reduced drawdowns if you trend follow with the longer term trends, monitor trade and actually swing on the shorter term frame, but only the direction of the longer term trend, like monitor your weekly and trade a daily or four hour. This is typical, still make big trends. Uh, you kind of lost me there, but if you if you boil down the longer term trend following, Okay, if you're trying to get from here to here, and that's a that's a long ways out. Okay, let's do this differently. You're trying to catch or capture a trend, and you hope to be with that trend for a long, long time. Okay, well, are you going to have to give this position a tremendous amount of run because that's going to look like something like this? Okay. If it does, even if it does take off, but if you are swing trading, and I'm going to reread your question after after I get my thought out here, if you're swing trading and you're taking that little bitty profit off here, 
and you're letting that stop widen out to hopefully ride out these gyrations throughout, and you're making that transition into that longer-term trader, then one, you have a smaller share size open out here. But Dave, would you want your biggest position open? Not necessarily. I mean, yeah, ideally, if you knew that was going to happen, but this doesn't always happen. So you have a little bit smaller position on than if you went with a full position because you took partial profits back here. So when it does begin to draw down, your drawdowns aren't going to be as bad. If you had that full position on, your drawdown would look like that, okay, as opposed to a little bit more of a gradual rollover. And if it does begin to take back off, you're back in business and you keep trailing that thing higher. Now, let me reread your question because it's um, – it's pretty intense, okay? I know it's important to have the one stock picks line up with the market and the sector are doing, but does this mean that the sector is doing well this week? Or is that the same question? We got a lot of questions in here. I'm sorry. Let me make sure I got the right question. Okay, here we go. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, other good question. I'll, uh, I'll get back to that one. Okay, would you be better off with reduced drawdowns if you – Trend follow with a longer term trend, monitoring the trade and actually swing trading with a shorter term frame, but only in the direction of the longer term trend. Okay, first of all, that's what we're doing. We're swing trading in the direction of the longer term trend. Uh, in some cases, it's a it's a emerging trend like a, a, like some of the energies we have in metals and mining portfolio now. But we are taking a swing trade, but then we're hoping that swing trade turns into something longer. Uh, if you're only taking short-term trades in the direction of the long-term trend. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're never going to get that big move out. You're never going to get this big, huge move out. And keep in mind with the short-term trading, the shorter your time horizon, okay, the less you're going to make because it takes time to capture a big move. And guess what? Sooner or later, there's going to be a big adverse move against you. If you're making lots of money on a trade and there's a big adverse move against you, you're giving up open profits and you can live with that. If you've captured some nice open profits to begin with and you get whacked on something, you could live with that too. So to wrap your head around it, just remember the shorter your time frame, the less money you're going to make and you still need to figure out a way to have open-ended profits. Let's say you're day trading and something happens and – you day trading futures or you're day trading even an individual stock you could have a halt in the middle of the day and if you're there scalping for pennies and all of a sudden the stock halves and you've got a big old leverage position on because you think you're you're safe because you're only going in for that little bitty piece of crumb that you know that that permanent income machine that you, that you think you develop then guess what now it might not happen that often but like Talib says just because you've never seen a black swan doesn't mean it can happen so I'm not sure I fully answered your question. Uh, can you rephrase that a little bit? And uh, we can come back to it if you want. All right. You're welcome, Travis. I know it's important to have one stock pick line up what the market and the sector are doing. That is correct. But does this mean that the sector is doing well this week or has it done well last month? Well, a lot of times – you're going to find the best setups or when they, the setup and the sector and the stock all look the same. So let's say the energies, what's the sector doing? Bottoming out and doing this. What are the stocks doing? Bottoming out and doing this. Uh, last few days notwithstanding, okay? And ideally, it'd be great if the market, the overall market was doing that too. Remember 2009 when the energies come flying off their lows and the overall market? The overall market looked like this. And the sector looked like this, and the underlying energies look like that. Okay, so ideally you want all three of those pieces to fit. You don't always get that. And then also within the sector, let's say this is a sector here, you want to make sure that most stocks within the sector also look pretty good. You want as much confirmation as possible. Now, if you're trading a transitional setup, you are a bit of a pioneer, and sometimes that setup might be a bit of a pioneer in and of itself, and it might be taken off before the overall sector. And in those cases, you can make a lot of money because you're getting into the, the, the stock early, the sector early, before the sector turns, okay? But ideally, and especially if you're not already successful as a trader, you only want to trade when as many pieces as possible fit, okay? 
So as a general statement, your sector should look a lot like your stock, okay? So I wouldn't pick the performance apart too much, okay? But in general, the sector should also be set up too. And or you could look at sector ETFs like uh, XME. I don't know if that's metals or or, or oil field, but it's one of those sectors. ETFs. I have to pull it up and look. It's pulling back now, okay. And so energy stocks might be setting up too, or metals and mining, whatever the case is. All right, let me make sure I answered your question. Is it important to have one stock's pick? I know it's important to have one stock pick line up with the market and sector doing, but this is mean the sector is doing well this week or has it done well last month? I, I, I don't think the sector is any different from the individual stock, stock. So if you're looking at an emerging trend that just emerged over the last few weeks, I think it's okay if the sector, or even if it's great if the sector, in fact, is just in an emerging trend over the last few weeks, okay? So use your time frame on your individual stock to, and your time in individual stock to transfer over to what the sector should be doing, okay? Now, ideally, if it's a non-commodity related stock, the overall market might also be doing this, might be, uh, might be, let's say the market's in a longer term trend. That's fine because the sectors might be bottoming out and the individual stocks might be bottoming out. But again, like in 2009, all three did the same thing. I sure, I sure do not look at the sector performance based on one day, but over what period of time do you want to see the sector doing well? Over the same period of time, at least as a setup, as a general statement. And how what does it have to be doing? Does it have to be in the top three or what? Well, I wouldn't rush out and, and try to uh, try to reduce it down to a relative strength sort and say I'm in the top three sectors or whatever, okay? You could run a portfolio like that, but that's a different type of, of, uh, of portfolio management. What we're trying to do is find the best setups regardless of the sector and ideally have the sector confirm what we're seeing, okay? So we're not going to say, okay, the top three sectors this week or these, and this is what we're going to stick to. I've I've done a lot of that type of analysis. I in, I put the Landry list in the uh, I'm sorry, the Landry 100. I put it in the cash um, into last year or whenever we had those signals. I forget when uh, last fall, just because it's a lot of work for something that I'm not actually that actually trading with real dollars. Uh, I, did, I had a fund a while back approach me, but it never really materialized. So, I mean, that, that would be a great thing to do if somebody actually was using it. Uh, now I just keep the stocks in my momentum list. So, yeah, if you're running a fund where you're, you're, you're playing the relative strength game, which has its own nuances, and there's some issues there, which I don't want to digress too far into. But it, it, I would much prefer, like, uh, Mike Moody does a lot of that type of work. Um, and I enjoy his stuff, and I learned a lot from him, and I, I like the relative strength stuff. But I don't use that directly in my trading to say, okay, I'm only going to be in the top three sectors. Okay, I don't quantify it that much. If I see a standalone setup that looks fantastic, even if it's in a crappy setup, if the if sector, even if the setup it just looks absolutely fantastic, even if the sector is not quite there, then I'll take it. Okay. All right. He's got it. Okay, good. I'll stop talking. <laughs> Very good stuff. You're welcome, Michael. That's profound. You're welcome, Phil. Have the tape. You had that tape, Michael? Of uh, really? I have to find find mine. Of uh, you mean of um, Douglas? That's a uh, good classic stuff. Oh, cool, cool. You and I are the only two on the planet, probably. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll get to that when we get to the portfolio. I mean, I'm sorry when we get to the market. Uh, can you explain your thoughts behind the March 11th purchase of AROC? Yeah, I got a house full of stuff here too. I was looking at all my, it just stacks up. Okay, Craig says, for me, it's position size slash money management that leads to the stable psychology. It's what attracted me to the methodology. Yeah, um, as I often say, and this is why, and, and I know you guys have seen enough of these speeches or plenty of these, where I talk about the three-stranded cord. And as they intertwine the money management psychology and the methodology, as you get better at one, the whole cord gets stronger. You get smarter at all three and better at all three. Well, pulling the money and position management out, as I wrote in layman's, 
money management will cure a multitude of sins, okay? Like we were just talking uh, to Rick, if Rick reduced his share size down to a very small amount, then he solves a psychology problem of trading and he's able to follow his plan and follow the methodology. So you see that psychology, methodology, and mind. They're all three intertwined. So once he gets good at following that plan, then his psychology improves. Then he can start bumping up that share size gradually towards that 2% number that we focus on. So absolutely, money management will cure a multitude of sin. Matt says, hey, Dave, I couldn't agree with more about the importance of trading with the money you, quote, don't need, unquote. Well, I hate to say you don't need because you always need money. No matter how much you have, you always need more. But how does a person without a lot of extra money ever transition to being a stock trader? That's a good question. You have to find some money or you have to trade at such a small size until you get that money, okay? You have to – there's a chicken and egg conundrum. That's something that I talked about um, that, that I'm working into a psychology course. I'm also going to put that into like a beginner's course, which is, is getting a pretty big psychology slant, as I said earlier. But it's a chicken and the egg thing. You cannot learn or follow a methodology and, learn, and, and know, get the psychology correct until you actually follow the methodology. So it's methodology, psychology. And, and it's kind of like a chicken and the egg thing. Again, you have to actually trade to understand the psychology. And you have to understand the psychology in order to trade. And it's just kind of this, this, it's this feedback loop. And the only way to actually learn is to actually trade. So you don't know how you're going to react until you actually trade. The problem is if you don't have money to trade, then you'll never do this part. So then you'd never get this part right. What I would suggest is figure out a way to trade at a very small size. Now, obviously, educate yourself before you get to this point here and maybe do some paper trading. But as I said in layman's, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. But always, of course, of course you want to always paper trade. There's actually uh, websites now out there that are pretty good. You could actually punch in some trades and they'll record them for you. So maybe do that or find some sort of practice account and do that first. But at some point, you're going to have to make a foray into real markets. And when you do, just figure out a way to do it at a small size and know that it's going to be tough to get your money management exactly right. Know that your friction costs are going to eat you alive. Okay, commissions are an example of friction costs. But if you're doing the right thing, when and if that money does come along, then you're going to be ready, okay? You don't want to to not trade and you don't want to not learn the psychology and all these things that go along with it and wait 10 years and then oh, you finally got the money, then what's going to happen? Well, you're going to blow, you're going to blow out. You're going to end up blowing that money out. So you have to learn sometime, okay? So, yeah, that's a tough part. Uh, money's not easy to come by, and I realize that. But trade at a very small size, okay? And then maybe your career will allow you to figure out a way to make more money in your career, which you could put towards your next career as a trader, okay? At some point, it seems that you have to take a leap. Absolutely. You have to, at some point, start trading some money. Otherwise, you'll never know how to trade the money especially if you're currently in a career that doesn't allow for a lot of extra savings advice. Well, is there, you know, I don't know what your situation is, but is there something you could do to supplement your income? Um, you know, if you're a dog trainer, maybe you could, you could start a coffee roasting company, but I guess that costs money too. I don't know. I, I can't answer for your situation, but is there a way for you to make more money in what you're doing? Uh, could you maybe, work towards getting out of debt if you're in debt and then you'd have extra income to put towards your trading endeavor. I mean, I don't know. That's something you're going to have to figure out. Um, I would hate to say, ask somebody to back you because that's a dangerous thing. You better do it on your own with your own money. 
before you put somebody else's capital in harm's way. And also that creates a lot of problems in and of itself. If you manage somebody else's money, they're going to treat you like a criminal when things aren't going well. They'll also pull the plug when things aren't going well at the worst possible time, right before you're getting ready to hit it big. So that adds a whole another can of worms to the process. So I don't have a quick answer for you. That's if, if I was doing get rich quick seminars, I would. But we all know that that doesn't exist. So figure out a way to trade at a very small size so you understand what you're doing. For some reason, I think you're a programmer. Can you take on some uh, contract programming jobs or something else? Okay. Uh, how much overhead supply is too much and how far back that is relevant? That's a long answer. I spent quite a bit of time in the uh, stock selection course on that. And, I, and if you don't have the course, go in and watch uh, YouTubes on that. I've talked quite a bit of that extensively, but I don't want to cut in everybody's uh, stock time today. So we'll get to that at some point. Yeah, I got out of OREG in in the 50s when it pulled back. Big mistake, Susan. Yeah, I mean, that's the tough part is getting knocked out of a position or, position or decide to exit early and then watch it take off without you. Warden has percent data sets which could be used for RS charting, eliminating the owning loosely money, but better than the S&P. Warden has percent data sets which could be used for RS charting, eliminating the owning losing money, but better than the S&P. Owning losing money. I don't know what that means, but you could do relative strange source if you want. Could one learn how to trade with futures, raise money, then trade equities? Uh, I think you would be better off doing just the opposite because futures are a very efficient market. You're, you're up against the big boys. You're up against the hedges. You're up against commercials. You're up against big speculators. I guess the big boys, same thing. That's going to be a hell of a lot harder to trade futures and get into stocks than the other way around. So you want to look for inefficiencies. Okay, Warden version 16 has paper trading. Okay, good to know. And also, I think that uh, Warren owns a brokerage. Warden owns a brokerage? I didn't know that. Um, okay, great advice. We're going to loop now. I'll get there. It just takes time trading small, like you said. Thanks for your advice. And, yes, I'm a programmer and working side jobs for, to get extra income. Yeah, you know. Cool, that's what I thought. I never met anyone who made money trading futures, just saying that. Oh, thanks. Okay, yeah, I'm glad you reminded me of that, Phil. Yeah, I, I, I got sidetracked in one of the other questions. The point I wanted to make is that futures are a hell of a lot harder to trade because they're more inefficient. doesn't mean that there might be an opportunity there. I think markets are markets and time frames are time frames, okay? As I told Stocks and Commodities uh, a couple days ago in an interview, but I think that you're better off focusing on inefficiencies and then in stocks, and once you get good at that, then figure out how to do, um, figure out how to recognize inefficient times and in efficient markets. And that's a whole nother lecture. Uh, but I would suggest the easiest way to do that is look for major lows and then trade transitions and only trade that. Okay. Dave, how do you make trades in Forex? They just uh, day trades or longer ter term trades. I make, um, I, there would be, I would say mostly, uh, yeah, I would make interday trades. Like I'll see something setting up and, and I'll try to hold on as long as possible. Um, I did some longer term Forex trading. Uh, the drawdowns are pretty tough in that, as you would imagine. And it's something that I'm not really focused on too much right now, although I do I did shut down my Forex screen right before it got started. So right now I wouldn't call I, I I do some intraday position trading, but I'm trying to position it for an interday position. Um, like sometimes I'll take a look at a five minute bow tie coming off of a major major low. Um, in fact, last week, if memory serves, a week before. I saw one coming into this webinar and I actually made the trade right before I started the webinar. After the webinar, I realized I just took a bow tie of a four hour chart and it wasn't an intraday chart. So that's kind of that's a G type of trading that I'm doing. And I may explore that further at some point, but I know that it's a more efficient market and I know it's harder to capture those trends there. 
and I know I'm playing up against uh, the big boys and all. So I would tread lightly on that. But one thing good about it is, if I had to say one thing good, is that you could start with a really small account and you could get some of those aforementioned reps in by by trading and, and taking like a twenty dollar risk or a thirty dollar risk per trade to where you're like, eh, so what? I just spent thirty dollars on lunch, you know, or I just spent two hundred dollars at a grocery store. Or what's what's twenty thirty bucks on a trade? So I I don't want to point you to forex because you could get into a lot of trouble with forex. But if you were just taking these little mini tiny mini accounts, even super mini contracts, which is like five dollars or something or whatever, then it is possible that you could get some reps in there. But just keep in mind, it's a really hard. It's really hard to trade currencies as opposed to trading stocks. Not that any of it's easy. All right. Uh, anyway, if you want the foresight and hindsight service, there it is. Uh, and you could find that under getting started on my website if you're looking for that. Uh, a couple things real quick, and then we'll hop into the charts. I know we're running a little late because I um, you asked a lot of good questions, and I kind of pontificated a little too much. I'm still rolling out my uh, new website. I think I'm pretty close to getting it where I want it to be. Uh, I do have a fast track thing that I put up uh, last week, or a few days ago, I should say at least, early this week. Um, if you if you're really serious and you get uh, everything, then I'll I'll give you everything for 50 percent off. And then I'll also give you a couple hours of my time. Um, and here's the thing, too. I'm just like I just kind of went on for a few minutes. I don't think I'll probably limit it to just two hours. But, you know, two hours is what I'm saying. But I, it'll probably be a little bit more. And I'm always here. Unlimited support on any product that you buy as it relates to the product. It doesn't mean that you buy the IPO course and then you email me and say, hey, Dave, I'm building a trading system. Help me build it. No, that's not what that means. But if you want to ask me about an IPO, then you can ask me uh, forever. So check that out if you get a chance. All right, let's hop into the charts. Uh, we're running out of time here quickly. Great questions today. Great bunch. I mean, I, you guys got me all fired up as usual. Uh, the question was on A Rock. Let's take a look at that real quick. If you want to talk about talk about individual stocks, uh, we'll get that. But somebody just asked, uh, what was my what was my thinking going into A Rock? And let's take a look at that. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's one that hasn't worked yet. So it would be a good one to pick apart. By the way, that's the other thing you should do is after getting into a, a trade, go back and look at that trade from the start. I like the fact that it was coming off of all time lows. Okay. And I think there was also a bow tie in there. Yeah, you had a bow tie coming off of all-time lows, okay? The stock also trades pretty cleanly. Notice that it worked its way down. It kind of consolidated a little bit. It worked its way lower, okay? It consolidated, worked its way lower. Now it's working its way higher, okay? Makes the bow tie and also had a nice little pullback in the bow tie. So that's why I took the trade. By the way, on every trade you take, back to chart, way out to that particular day, win, lose, or draw, and say, hey, would I take this trade again? Okay. So the bow tie, I think, set up. There it is. Okay. Well, it was a first thrust first, and then the bow tie set up. The bow tie was getting ready to set up, but it was a first thrust first, meaning that it made all time lows, and then it made a nice thrust. If I get my chart back off of those lows, let me what color you guys want. Yellow's fine. Okay, let me save that template. I was doing some screen captures earlier. Okay, uh, so that's why I, that's why I took the trade. And if I saw if I saw a trade look like that again, I would be all over it. Also, bigger picture, cup and handle, lots of good things going on here. Little tiny bit of overhead resistance, not enough for me to worry about. Okay. Now let's take a look at uh, if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, do so now. I'll try. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time in the market. There's not a whole lot to really uh, gleam out of this market. First of all, as I've been saying, ad nauseum, I think we're overbought in here. We've had a nice, really good run from lows, and now it looks like we're beginning to correct from that run up higher. But, Dave, it looks like a pullback. Well, it might just be a pullback. But the problem is you've got overhead supply, shorter term and longer term to overcome. 
And when you back the chart way out, especially if you even take a look at like a weekly chart, and look, see it goes to logarithmic on that. I think that's logarithmic. What is this L over here? Anybody know? Is this linear or logarithmic, and what's the difference? I don't even know. I don't think it makes a difference. But on a weekly chart, you could see that it is kind of stalling out in this run. And also, as I've been saying, a nausea on a weekly chart, we still have this bow tie working from way back here last summer, triggered in September, I think. And that sell signal remains in effect until and unless the market makes new highs because that's a major sell signal. Now go back and watch prior videos on this. Not enough time to cover today again, but there's plenty of videos out there covering that. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. Same sort of action there too. So far just kind of pulling back from lows, rolling over a little bit in here as of late. Let's take a look at the longer term chart, back to chart way out. And again, to me, that looks like a big picture top. Also, never forget one of the easiest, it's the most amazing things to me, Grab or, or point your cursor at where the market is and drag your trend line backwards in time and see how far you can go back and intersect the bars of bars past. And you can see that if you did that or even if you did like a sort or, or what or you did like a measurement in this. So the market went up one half of a percent and nearly four months i'm sorry at one year and four months okay so even if you didn't know anything about trading you could say well this market has gone sideways for a year and change take a look at the rusty weekly basis running out of steam looks like it's turning back down pretty obvious pullback there by the way i was just showing my peeps last night uh, the easiest way to detect a pullback is connect the high to the low of the move, okay, and then the recent high to that low, and then guess what? That's your pullback. So, so far, it just looks like a pullback, okay? That's a weekly chart. When you back the weekly out, guess what? You can go all the way back to where? 2013, okay? Let's get a measurement on this. So, if you go all the way back to 2013, uh, let's say last summer sometime. Depends on what hour of the day it is, morning or afternoon, but you got a 1% change. I mean, that could change overnight. So you could actually be negative going back a couple of years in the S&P 500. That's pretty amazing. I'm sorry, in Russell 2000. So that's pretty scary. Not a whole lot to deduce uh, in the sectors. Some, like drugs, remain so far, as you can see, a pretty serious downtrends. Some have had major retrace rallies, such as retail. But I wouldn't rush out and buy retail just yet because these V-shaped recoveries at high levels are hard to sustain. The market's already overbought here to keep going higher and mount a leg on top of a leg is going to be pretty hard to do. Okay, Stranger things have happened, but I wouldn't rush out and buy. There's not too many sector, sectors I would rush out and buy at this juncture until the market could show some improvement. Now, I do like the energies and metals and mining still because they've made a nice little run from lows. And so far, this is the first kind of serious correction we've had. And I think this is going to set up a plethora of setups. I think I'm going to see a plethora of setups tonight. You also have your bow ties and all that good stuff working in these sectors. There's the energies. There's the metals and mining. So I will continue to look for opportunities here. And again, I think this is the first serious correction we're seeing. The good news is if you miss this whole move, this is your second chance to get in. Now, I'm not saying rush out and buy these stocks, but I'm saying if you see a setup, take it. But take it, but by take it, I mean wait for an entry because that in and of itself can often keep you out of trouble. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm fat figuring my questions here. All right. How do we get the questions back out? Here we go. Okay. So I don't think the market's doing fantastic just yet, and I wouldn't get too excited just yet. So that's the, the bottom line. So let's wait and see if this thing can follow through before getting too excited. Okay, OCLR for Mr. Andre. Uh, yeah, it looks okay, but it's at new highs. It's not actually set up at this juncture. Uh, I don't like that gap down that it made. My, How do I get rid of oh, There we go, F2. 
Uh, maybe on a pullback. I'm not nuts about this big gap down. I don't like the behavior there, so I think I would find something else. L is log, A is arithmetic. What's the other L? There's two L's. See, there's an L, there's an L, there's an L, and there's an L. What does that one do? Oh, that's just like a percent or something. X is me is a second. Yeah, I like X and me. As I said earlier, X and me is with the metals. Um, I do like X and me. Uh, if you didn't know which which metal to buy, then then take a look at X and me. You've got a really nice trend here, and then you got your first little serious or somewhat serious pullback. I'd almost like to see more of a knockout move there. But yeah, I think that's I think that's worth a shot. I I like it. I like it a lot. You're gonna have some resistance to deal with along the way, but that's okay in this particular case. Michael says, when using the S&P for RS, the danger is owning something that is going down, but less than the S&P will show positive results. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, Michael's saying that the danger of, of playing the relative strength game is the S&P is going down, and you're in stocks that are going down less than the S&P. You're beating the S&P. I think uh, Greg Moore said it the best. You can't live off relative strength. You can't eat relative strength, okay? You can't feed yourself off relative strength, um, at least – in that particular case, okay? Now, if the market's going up and you're in stocks that are beating the S&P, then by all means, yes. The data sets are FX5 and more right than they are Warden 7. And they are more than are right. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the new uh, the new TC. I'll, I, at some day, I'll, uh, I'll get to it. Uh, thanks for your explanation on AROC. You're welcome. Nice show. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, question about Rick. That's going to be a gold miner. Uh, it's been kind of chopping around as of late. It's also slightly on the thin side, not incredibly thin. I think I would pass for now, just as it's been chopping around. Um, you're not familiar with the old TC yet. <laughs> My daughter used to have a friend, and uh, she moved away, but it was kind of funny. It's like she would laugh, like, ha, 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 And you'd think she was laughing at you, but she was laughing at with you. So, ha, 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 or that. Uh, Susie says, hello, Dave. After listening over one year, I have to pay you now. All right. Fantastic. I'm glad it only took a year. I got some people emailing me for like 10 years. I'm like, God, this guy is, is mentally challenged. I've been – it's like, could you reread the book again? Oh, I've been meaning to buy that. It's like, well, <laughs> you gotta at some point you gotta learn, get the, get the material to learn. Uh, GGB is okay. Um, this is one that I'm. Um, my daughter hasn't bothered to uh, to sit down with me in a stock contest. I put her in this one about a, uh, a few days ago when I was making new highs. Uh, it does have a little overhead supply, but it's it's pretty much overcome it. Uh, I think it's okay. Uh, I think it's not bad. You can certainly do much worse. So, but yeah, I'm kind of mad at her because I was going to use her as a guinea pig for um, how a simple system could beat the market, but she hasn't bothered to talk to me about it yet. Okay, DRD, DRD, another gold stock. Yeah, these goals are getting a little choppy in here. There's one we're looking to go after, but it's be it's become so choppy we might not even take it. Uh, now, but yeah, too much sideways action as of late. Remember, we look for perfection going into us to a setup, but then we accept what the market gives us. So if you're already long this one, then it still looks pretty good. I imagine if you put some moving averages in there, you probably got, uh, you know, a longer term moving average looks pretty good. Let's put a 50 day moving average, see what it looks like. So yeah, try your stop if you're already long is a 50 day moving average. And that's what, by the way, that's what a stop will look like longer term once you transition to the longer term trend trading mode. It'll look like a longer term moving average. Okay. Uh, Steve wants to know about MLNX. ML, MLNX. Uh, well, the problem with the civvies is they've been kind of choppy as of late. It kind of all over the place. Uh, longer term, when you back the chart way out, you could see it sort of bottomed out, major bottom in place. Uh, maybe on the next pullback. It, I'd like to see it. See, it really had to clear this prior little little peak here. So I'd like to see it clear that decisively. Oops. I'd like to see it clear that decisively and then on a pullback. So, yeah, put it on your momentum list, but um, I don't see anything to be done with this one at this juncture. 
Craig says, probably one of the only ways to start small is off major major lows like we saw at 07, 09. Yeah, I mean, it helps. It helps to be, I mean, the uh, what's the saying? The um, luck is uh, hard work and opportunity. What's, what's the saying about that? Jeez, you have to be, you know, there's a lot of people that make a lot of money and, and, and they write about them. And I think to myself, well, yeah, they were in the right place at the right time, but you still have to be smart enough to do that. So it's like I don't want to discount what they've done. Uh, and some of these people, if you talk to them today, they'll tell you. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because they'll tell you. I'll let them tell you personally. And they'll say, yeah, that worked then, but there's no way in the world I could ever do that again. That was just a bit of an aberration. So I hear what you're saying. It would be great if you if you could come in like a 2000 in uh, nine where everything is going straight up off the lows and start buying with small amounts in and get used to trading. Unfortunately, unless you're used to trading coming into something like that, you're not going to recognize that opportunity. So um, it's a chicken and the egg thing. I know the harder you work, the more luck you have. That's what I'm looking for. The harder you work, the more luck you have and the more luck you create. Okay. Phil, Phil also has a quote I was looking for. Luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So I hear what you're saying, uh, Craig, that, yeah, the best way to is start with a little bit of money and then catch the market just right. But unless you start trading up for the next five years, when that when that opportunity presents itself five years from now, you're not going to be ready. Just like IPOs on a selected basis still remain in pretty much a bull market. There's some very selected IPOs out there that I'm still following. And in 2014 was a pretty good, really good market for IPOs, 2013, 2014, 2015. And now there's still a select a few out there. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is, believe it or not, I have one. When I wrote my IPO course in 2015 or whenever it was, I was worried that the bull market would come to an end. But the point I made over and over in that was like, that's OK. Get the knowledge now, and there will be another bull market in IPOs. And so far, it's kind of hung in there a lot longer than I thought it ever would, although now it's very, very selective, and only a few stocks are really taken out, taken off in the IPOs. But, yeah, you have to have that education today for when that opportunity comes tomorrow. Absolutely. Great quotes. Thank you. I trade futures while I would never say never. I don't think they trade the same type of patterns that you traded stocks. Uh, you know, we'll have to debate that. Uh, to some extent, yes, but no, they're not easy to trade. Okay, MXL. Two of you asking about MXL. Uh, that's another semiconductor. No, and the reason I don't like it is and somebody recently was emailing about a stock that looked a lot like this. I like a stock to take out the prior high decisively unless you're at low, low levels, like a cup and handle, bow tie, first thrust, those type of patterns. But it barely got past its prior highs in here. Now it's come all the way back in. So I would leave that alone. Okay. On a micro level, I actually kind of like that pattern, but only if it looks like this. And that's what I call a double top knockout. But we're talking a very small swing trade pattern it looks like that as opposed to a big picture pattern it looks like this i would not take this because it didn't really clear those prior highs decisively nhtc national health or natural health whatever uh no it looks like an electrocardiogram it's all over the place it's up it's down it's up it's down jackie mason stock leave it alone luck is when prep meets opportunity absolutely i agree FX10, I don't have that. SQ for Susi, uh, SQ, I hope saying your name right. Uh, SQ, let's take a look at that. Um, that's an IPO. It's got pretty good volume. I, I think what I would do at this juncture is I would wait for this to make new highs and then look to play it on a pullback. But, yeah, that could be certainly another uh, – a bull, bull uh, type of market in this particular stock. But right now, I don't see anything to get me excited about it until and unless it makes new highs. Um, this wide range bar here is a little concerning, but until it gets, um, and the reason I'm saying that, I was going to talk about maybe a possible breakout strategy here, but what 
what I preach in my breakout strategies is it's a, as a general rule, you don't want to trade a breakout strategy in an IPO until and unless it takes out its prior high. So I wouldn't buy the breakout here. I would let it take out that prior high and look to play a, a pullback. Okay. Yes, you do. I don't know what I did. What I do. Uh, speaking of IPOs, PayPal. Well, PayPal is a big, thick stock. So it's kind of hard to get excited about a big, thick, 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 thick stock like this, okay? Uh, if you back the chart out, it's just kind of all over the place. It's kind of an electrocardiogram. If you look at it on a micro level, it gapped down today. You don't want to see gaps against the trend. That's going to be a pretty good interview, by the way. I talked about a lot of the things I'm covering today uh, got fitted to the interview. It's like five pages long. It's pretty amazing. pretty excited about it. This is my second interview I did for um, Stocks and Money. Smith & Wesson, SWHC. WHC. Uh, it looks okay. Uh, the only problem that I have with it is the knockout move does come back below this prior high. But on a relative basis, given the nature of the overall market, I'd say it looks okay. Uh, if you did take the trade, I don't want to use the word safe, but I think a fairly safe entry would be above the high and a stop below today's low, whatever it ends out. But again, I personally wouldn't take it because it came back below this prior peak. This one can be a little squirrely. I guess the news kind of affects it a little bit. Uh, everybody runs out, buys a bunch of guns whenever there's fear mongering about you can't buy guns anymore. And then then they say they're going to eliminate guns or whatever. Then everybody freaks out, blah, blah, blah. I know came from eBay, but PayPal, ref. PayPal still a big company. Matt says, great futures advice today, Dave. The siren call always gets me thinking a few good trades a day, get consistent income, harder than it looks. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, at one point I needed income, and I was trading S&P futures back when they were the big contract, and I was making $1,000 in the morning and losing $2,000 in the afternoon on a daily basis. So <laughs> it was tough. You know, maybe I should, you know, note to self, maybe just trade the mornings. Uh, part of my problem in perfect hindsight was, I was trading a lot during the summer where it was real choppy and market was trending before that. And then I was doing well, but it's a horrible way day trading and the trading futures on top of that. It's a horrible way to try to pull income out of a market. In fact, as a general statement, it's, it's horrible just to try to pull income out of a market. It's just, it's just very, very difficult. But if you could trade for longer term trends by trading for short term trends first and positioning yourself for longer term trends, then longer term, you'll be pleasantly surprised. The problem is most people can't wait for the longer term. As I often say, people have to give up right before the next big trend hits. Okay, uh, Phil's saying a lot of stocks are getting hit hard today, so we'll see some TKOs tonight, probably so. Get into CNX here in a pullback? Yeah, I think so. Let's take a look at it. Boy, we're going extra long today. We're gonna have to wrap it up so I don't lose the recording soon. Yeah, here's a case of a double top knockout, which is a little bit, if you're new to charting, you might wonder what's the difference between this and that other stock, but this is a shorter term type, a little flat plateau, a little bit of a knockout. The question is, is this worth a re-entry? Absolutely. I think it looks good. In last night's trading service, this is one we're long, I suggested that uh, it might be, it should be on my Landry list. I forgot to put it on. But yeah, you've got a bigger, longer term picture bottom here. You've got a nice thrust from lows. And you've got that double top sort of knockout looking pattern. It just looks like a really good stock to me. I like it still. I mean, you know, we're long. So uh, I don't want you to think I'm talking my position. But, yeah, I think it looks good. Okay. I think we're going to have to go ahead and shut things down. Let me let me get to somebody real quick. BIIB, that's going to be an inverse thing. And I'm going to – I would suggest – no, that's Biogen. Never mind. I was thinking it was the uh, inverse biotech. Uh, no, it's just kind of sideways as of late. Is it up or down? I think it's probably still headed lower, but it's pretty choppy and you got some big gaps in there. The only problem with shorting something like biotech is it could be a bumpy ride, be kind of dangerous. They approve a drug or something, but a big fat one like this might be okay to short if you have the pattern, but unfortunately it's just kind of trading sideways. So I'd leave that alone. FX5, yeah, I'm not familiar with that. I have to study that. Happy Easter. You're welcome, Don. You too, buddy. Thanks for coming. Great insight. You're welcome. Nail or Nal? Okay. Nail? That must be a joke. 
Okay, look, we're gonna we're out of uh, we're out of time, so um, I better run out. Uh, again, I want to thank everybody for coming. To those who celebrate, happy Easter. Uh, to those who don't, enjoy your day off from the market uh, tomorrow. And uh, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again between now and then, uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Feel free to shoot me any questions in the meantime. Everybody, again, enjoy the weekend, and I'll see you next week. Thank you.